good. Then so one more time. All right, so my name is Yan Su Kim and I'm the Federal Executive Director and School of Forestry. It's my pleasure to introduce Margaret Hengen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to get her last name right. She has a lot of experience in both private sector and federal agency. And you know, in addition to her professional work as an archaeologist dealing with all these complex issues related to natural resource management. She's also the one of the leaders leading the issues, addressing issues with diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. in federal agencies. And that includes uh, LGBT recognition and as well as the racial and ethnic diversity. So, and she is our newest member of our advisory committee and helping School of Forestry to become the number one leader in promoting diversity in natural resource management. So thank you all for joining from Zoom and in person. And here's Margaret. All right, thank you. And I, I actually would like to thank you and Sue for inviting me. And she's the one who actually um, came up with this topic, um, which actually was a challenge for me and a good challenge. Uh, I apparently like challenges. And mainly because this is uh, the topic of, of timber in, in Northern Arizona is something that I've relegated to another professional, uh, Dr. Jack Reed. He and I had done a lot of presentation around Black history in Northern Arizona together, but this particular topic was his. And unfortunately, he's in Wisconsin. So uh, and I, I draw a lot of, on his work but also I, I learned a lot by doing this, by having to sit down and really look at the data. I was probably a little over ambitious. <laughs> so, uh, but this presentation I've kind of put together over the last couple of days based on information I already had. And thanks to, to uh, Dr. Reed, I luckily had a lot of his presentation. So I will be drawing a lot in his work. But I also want to point out that um, you know, this is a topic that has that not a lot of people are very familiar with in terms of the fact that there was a very large presence of African Americans in the timber timber industry and has been for several hundred years. And people are, and including even some Black people, are very unaware of the role of of, of Black of African Americans in the timber industry and. And, and how that came to be here in Arizona and why the history of the development of the timber industry really led to um, black involvement in the timber industry in Northern Arizona. So with that, I will, and I'm gonna plow through this. I would ask that people please, those who are online, please put your questions in the chat. I will answer questions in the end. Okay, thank you. I'm still speaking at logistics. So go ahead, um, because I probably have a lot of slides, I'm gonna plow through this, but please put your questions in the chat or those of you who have questions who are here, please um, hold off to the end so we can make sure we get through the presentation if people need to leave. So um, let's make sure I can. One of the first things I wanna start with, and it occurred to me as I was putting together this presentation is that when you think about lumber industry and lumbermen and timber industry, we kind of have a, a mythology around it, including um, NAU's own mascot. And that, you know, th this idea of, of timbermen and timber and those who work in the timber industry, and, and which is true for some parts of the country, such as the Midwest and the, and the Northeast of, of the United States and the timber industries there, that is primarily dominated by the very burly looking white men. But when you get towards the South and Southern areas and uh, the South, and then it also in later years when Arizona, when Arizona's timber industries really take off, um, you really find that a majority that is much more ethnically diverse than people realize. And you would not know that looking at the timber industry today, but certainly um, up until probably the 50s and early 60s, timber industry here in Arizona was much more ethnically diverse than folks have come to understand. So with that, but to talk about the, the, 
black black skin, the timber industry, you really have to look at the, the, the development of the timber industry, the history of the timber industry, and as well as slavery in the United States. So one of the things I found out, uh, which looking at this, is that the timber industry really was a very early industry, and, one, and timber and wood products is probably one of their earliest uh, exports the United States ever had, even going back to the Jamestown period. So, um, so we're talking Jamestown 1607, first slaves, of course, come to the United States uh, right about um, 1619, as everyone knows that date by now. So early, the early um, log industry was kind of burgeoning as, as you get the immigration of the United States, the development of, of, of the colonies. They see wood products as, as a, an export and they are being exported. There's the labor is uh, probably those of the colonists and you get a lot of immigrants. But of course, at this point, you're starting to see um, slaves coming into the US and I'm sure being that lumbering is a labor intensive field, you would see black people probably out into some of these operations. By the 1630s, you see this development of, of, uh, of a naval industry or a ship and building industry. And of course would be at this time, we, these uh, ships of course would be wood. So obviously there'd be a need for wood to supply this industry. Um, and apparently my understanding is a lot of it was looking for trees for masts, as well as doing board feed and other types of products that would have been used for the ship industry, but also exported out to um, other countries. Key to this though is of course slavery, which is developing does by about 19, 04 is um, actually abolished in the northern part of the United States, but the majority of the timber industry at this point is in fact the Northwest. So we're talking Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. This is where the majority of that is. So there would have been other laborers available. Of course, the Irish are coming in and other immigrants who would have been available. I thought this, this statistic was particularly interesting. So by the 1790s, you have New England is exporting 36 million feet of, of pine board. And uh, as I said, 300 ship mass. So that is in fact quite, yeah, considering the time frames and the technology, that's quite a bit of wood that they're exporting out. But this changes with the development of the American Industrial Revolution and it's pointed out also the fact that you've got America is moving towards the east into the open plains area, which doesn't is very wood poor. So there's becomes this huge demand for um, timber, um, which soon is exhausted. So in the South, what's happening, and this is where the slave labor especially comes in. So in the South, and I actually didn't understand this, in the South, what's happening is a different type of industry, and that is the turpentine industry. So pine, come to find out, pine is actually one of the sources of turpentine. It's actually, and I had to look this up, um, it, it is, in fact, hold on. I, I didn't know what it was, so I had to look it up. I figured I wasn't the only one who didn't know what it was. So really, it's a fluid, you know, it's, and it's obtained from the, 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 the Cambrian, I assume, of the tree. You guys are all forestry folks. You could probably talk about this in much more technical terms than I can. But the point is, is that this is a product that comes from pine trees. It's, it's labor intensive in that you're, you're actually getting into the trees. And I actually found an example. This actually is in Fort Valley Experimental Forest. I talked with Susan uh, Old Olberding, Olberding about this. She's the one who wrote, has written several books on the history of Fort Valley Experimental Forest. And she said, starting right about 1910 through 1912, they actually did some experiments with timbering. And it's, I think it's no, no surprise to see you have a black man here who probably learned to do uh, this process in the South, I'd be, be my guess. Um, so he probably came and said this is something he may have learned in the South. The turpentine industry was huge, and this was specifically to supply the naval force with this material. Um, and uh, from what I read, when they had this thing called the science of forestry coming in in the late 1800s, it kind of changed the, the uh, industry for this because they recognized this is very 
detrimental to the trees. And so Susan actually, she emailed me about this and she said they, you know, they did the experiments and she, and it, they ended it in, in, in 1912. She says there's actually still some vials in the, in, at the uh, experimental station of the, what they collected at that time. And she felt that they chose not to use this as an economic pursuit here, but it could have actually been used here. And I know having managed forests in California, this was something that was done in California as well. Anyway, just as an interesting aside. So in the South, as the North was being exposed, uh, uh, as the Northern timber resources were being ex exported and exploited in large amounts, in the South, what you're seeing is really this, this turpentine industry. And it is very labor intensive and dominated by slaves as being the primary labor. So in the South, of course, you have to think about post and pre Civil War because it's a major part of, of the South's um, history and econ economy. So um, key thing here is that once the Civil War is done, then you get into that period of reconstruction. So we're talking 1865 on as a period of reconstruction. And part of the reconstruction is figuring out how to, what to do with this newly freed population, but also how to actually restart the economy of the South, which has been devastated by years of war because the majority of the war was of course fought in the South. So a lot of those infrastructure systems had already had been destroyed and there, so you had to figure out how to re, reinvigorate that economy. Um, so, and also which I thought was interesting is that the industrial revolution that had been happening and moving so quickly up in the North really was not happening as, as rapidly in the South because much of their economy was based on agri agriculture. Um, rice, cotton, um, tobacco, um, that had been the uh, majority of their, ag of their economy. So um, that industrialization had not really happened to the extent in the South as it had an extent in the North. So as I said, government efforts to try and stimulate the economy uh, did not work well. Uh, apparently they did pass a, um, a homesteading act that was specific to the South that was not very popular. And ultimately, what you ended up having is a lot of north as the the resources of the northern forests were being were being exhausted. These companies had to figure out new new places to find wood. And so, what you see is these is these number companies in the north begin to look to the south and the resources south, and they start buying up the land, basically to start uh, setting up operations in the south. So by eighteen nineties you're seeing essentially this reinvigoration of the economy in the South through sawmill counts. Um, so really it became, at least according to what I read, it became the economic driver of the South. Being that lumbering, as we all know, requires a lot of labor. Um, and you had this new labor class that had just recently been free uh, black people become uh, a major part of the labor source for uh, the southern um, uh, sawmill towns, um, and which really, really um, began to really um, explode in the South. So when by the South, by this point, we're, we're talking about really is Louisiana, Arkansas to some degree, definitely Texas, Alabama. So those are the areas that are really being exploited. And it creates this opportunity um, for these newly freed black people who basically had already only worked in, um, ag up at this point, primarily agrarian op um, situations. So this is probably one of the biggest, this was, I guess, one of the biggest uh, sawmills uh, in Louisiana at that time. Um, and from what I understand, the, the need for popular need for labor is so huge that they really are talking about an amazing amount of workers per mill. So the statistics I came up with is so in Louisiana, Texas alone, yeah, over 2000 sawmills were established. Um, 
roughly and then you know per mill you're talking about three to four hundred workers per mill that's a lot of people that they're bringing in for the laborers turns out these towns realize that they're if you're going to bring in their 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 urban their kind of rural areas and uh if they're going to operate and operate efficiently they begin to realize that they literally had to create communities so very much similar to the industrial towns and manufacturing towns of the north, they the southern mill towns also or southern mill companies also basically recognize that there's a need to provide um, opportunities not only to bring in this labor but also provide for their families and basically create a a, a um, business town a sawmill town. Um, and so then that's exactly what they did. They they actually build housing. They created uh, community centers. They had large commissaries. People were paid in script, which they could use and uh, by getting their supplies at the commissaries. So you had churches, you had educational centers, you probably had recreation centers. You had all those things that a small community would want and support your families while the workers um, toiled large areas. Now, we are talking the South though. So by this point, by after the 1890s, reconstruction has basically ended. And now you're into a period where African-Americans are being uh, systematically oppressed using through laws and so both regulations and laws and social mores uh, in a system known as uh, Jim Crow. Um, so, we're looking at an industry that's hiring a lot of people of color, but at the same time dealing with the fact that they are in the South with this with Jim Crow, and how do you how do you balance out these two these two areas? And so what you find is that they come up with various different ways to which to manage that that social requirement, but at the same time also provide a lot of work opportunities. And you do see that there is differences in how the black workers are, are treated in these towns. Let's see. So before I get into that, I think, especially for those of us who grew up in the West, it's always, it's always important to explain what the differences are between what, the, what they did in the South and Jim Crow and basically what happened in the West. Racism basically happened throughout the United States. It still does. But here in the West, I grew up in California, so I understand in the West, we, you know, what we have is really more of a, syst a systemic racism. So a lot of social, um, there are laws to some degrees that do support segregation and racism, but it, by and large, a good chunk of it is through so social norms and mores. So for instance, here in Arizona, in 1909, the state actually um, elected to segregate the school systems and it remained segregated until uh, 1953. So in recognized 1909, Arizona didn't become state till 1912. So they actually segregated the school systems before the state was out, actually a state. And part of this had to do with the fact that you had a lot of Southerners who had left the South and were coming into Arizona and they were bringing with them their social beliefs. So, um, but the difference here is that black people actually, and I've saw plenty of evidence that black people could actually vote in Arizona. Whereas in the South, they were systematically uh, barred from voting. So there are some real differences, but um, there's a lot less violence associated with the racism here in Arizona or in California in the Western states than the Southern states where you had uh, vigilantes uh, like the KKK and other people who were out um, threatening physical violence. So that is a real difference between the Black experience of the South and the West. So um, just to kind of compare and contrast, and that also helps to, um, this part of the, you know, that feeds into why some Black people leave the South to come to the West or, or go north. north. So it's important to understand that, and and systemic racism here in Arizona is is continuing. It was, you know, enforced through various different other you know, norms. For instance, yeah, this is the newspaper in Williams. Um, there were black people living in Williams, but yet you you know these types of norms were enforced even through social and you know popular media. 
All right, so get back into talking about the sawmill town. So as I said, they, there was segregation and there was um, different, depending on what class you were part of is you that depended on what you what type of resources you had access to and economic resources so everybody who came to these towns uh got some sort of housing and and black people whole families would live in these towns but my understanding from what i read is in most cases the black the black families probably had lived in basically a segregated area and oftentimes their homes were a little smaller and you see that kind of thing in any industrial town the where the workers were and depending on where they were in the caste system of the work of the labor they got less than somebody say a manager for instance a manager would have access to a little more a nicer home a little more opportunity than than a laborer was so that's really not that unusual for any industrial town at this time but it, you know, overlay that into Jim Crow and the South and segregation that it feeds into that. Um, so really, what we're talking about is the labor caste system. So, and this is actually a system that's throughout the United States. But I, and you'll see that this is a system that basically got superimposed here into Arizona as well when when the timber industry came to Arizona. Um, this is a system they developed and that you had African Americans were able, they certainly were employed and they were employed at a certain level of the system, which was basically this is acceptable. This is the place that black people are acceptable to be hired and to work. Whereas depending on where you were, you know, and we're talking about with friends, if you were Mexican or Irish, depending on where you are, because a lot of the Mexican workers were coming in in Texas. They, they had a different strata of work in places, not that they couldn't be laborers, but their upward mobility was limited to a certain level. And same with the white Anglo um, workers, they were likely to be managers or higher up and being in charge and, and had much, much higher upward mobility. Timber industry wasn't the only one that did this. If you think about it, um, the ranching industry did the same thing, black cowboys where you didn't see black black cowboys being get, putting in as ranch managers, but they certainly were accepted to be hired at a certain level uh, of the system. And so that's basically what it is. It's a, it's a basically, it's an unofficial caste system, a labor caste system that gets, and it is with that, and you superimpose that with, with segregation and superimpose it with Jim Crow, that helps to really, um, support this, this caste system. Um, so, but I found, found this interesting. So by, yeah, 1927, you're seeing 200,000, 200,000 workers who see themselves as lumbermen with 23% of that being black. So that's a huge workforce of black trained lumber workers by 1927. All right, so this is where I'm really transitioning into Dr. Reed's work, and that by the 1920s, by the 1920s, you start seeing a depletion of lumber resources in the South. So, um, including seeing some of these big towns starting to close up because the resources have been overexploited, essentially. Um, so. As you start seeing the economy collapse, these companies are begin trying to figure out how to basically survive and stay alive. And so they start looking for new sources of income. Um, and this is where Arizona, of course, comes in. So by 1920s, we, all, we do have lumber companies here. Saginaw Manistee is operating over in Williams. Saginaw Manistee came out of the Midwest. Saginaw and Manistee, actually, their management made it very clear that they didn't hire Black people, even though there were Black people in Arizona working in the lumber industry prior to this time. Um, some, especially these companies that are coming in from the Midwest, where they weren't used to having Black labor, uh, they, in fact, would actually not necessarily hire Black, um, black uh, labor in, in there. But some of the other companies here in Flagstaff did. 
but you didn't have a lot of black laborers at that time. By the 1920s with the collapse of the Southern industry, now we have this new class of people who've got all this training and are looking for new uh, employment opportunities. Um, and they do find it here in Arizona. So those who are familiar with McNary and the Katie Lumber Company, this is just one example of this. They would, and I thought this is really interesting, they literally closed their doors on February 7th, 1924, and then three days later opened up. They had bought a new, uh, a, a mill at, um, in Cooley, Arizona, which they renamed McNary, which is on the White Mountain Apache Reservation. They purchased that along with a, a railroad. And th then literally three days later, they shut one plant and they opened up another one in Arizona, taking with them all of their workers. I, this shocked me. This apparently is a photo of them putting the workers on the railroad to, to basically come to Arizona to open up this new, uh, this new mill. Um, bear in mind, this is the South. So these cars, these railroad cars would have been segregated until they got passed over the out of the south and then they would have been integrated but they they you could not because black labor had become such an integral part of their operations they could not conceive the idea of not bringing a their workers but also a significant amount of them had to be black because these are the, these are the folks who had the skills that they needed to be able to open up and operate here in Arizona but What's critical here, not only do they bring their operations, they also bring with them their social mores and their labor class system or caste system comes with them and they bring it with them and it becomes part of the system here in Arizona. So just uh, your basic company town, commissary. The other, and again, we've got segregation. So we've got black people coming in and employed in large amounts, but they are being segregated into a separate area, a living area. They have, you know, like most of these towns in Katy, they have separate churches, they have separate schools, um, and but yet there, these people are in fact out in the in the field together. They are working together in the mills. They are working together in the forests, um, but yet in the in their community operations they are actually being kept separate all right so once the katie company re comes here to arizona this basically sets off a migration helps us set off a migration as i said we had two hundred thousand southerners who were lumbermen, 23 of which were black, that that industry is dying. People are getting out and looking for opportunities. This is unique because usually when you look at the black diaspora of the South, they're usually going from agri agriculture into manufacturing industries in the North. In this case, and this is where Jack, Jack Reed's work really highlighted this. In this case, there, these, are temp, these are experienced, timber workers coming out of the south going to a new timber area so they're bringing they they've got the skills that they're bringing with them into arizona and as well as into the pacific northwest and come to find out california um so they are taking these they are skilled workers identified skilled workers that are coming out and into these other areas as the southern timber um industry is dying you're moving into new economic opportunities. So just to give you a sense of what that change was in Arizona. Yeah, so 1920, according to the census, we've got 8,000 black people who self-identified in, in here. But by 1930, you can see right up through 1950s, where the majority of this migration is really kicking off is really in the in after World War II, right up into the 50s and 60s, is you can see where that major massive of, of black and primarily lumber workers. Now, black people here in Arizona are not only working in the lumber industry, but the, the, the uh, mining industry and the globe, the copper mining industry also had quite a, few, quite a bit of a black labor. And then also the cotton growing industry south of Phoenix. 
they were also bringing in a lot of black people. Um, so uh, that's the other thing that's growing this, but certainly the lumber industry was a big contributor to that increase in the black population of Arizona. So again, the major reasons why people are moving, well, the economy is dying in the South and you've got all these great skills and, they, and here's an opportunity in the North. So when Katie shows up and, and they, they check, set, show up shop, the, one of the things that comes out is that they are actually paying their workers better. Um, so due to various different union wins, um, people are actually making uh, more money, better money here in, in the North than they were in the South. Uh, so, and then there's, of course, there's the, there is the high demand and then it doesn't help, doesn't hurt. And I love this, this statement, um, you know, because of the violence associated with Jim Crow in the South, although there was in fact racism and segregation here in the North, those, those mores came with the expansion of the lumber industry. They still, the violence, the threatened violence of the South and Jim Crow is less. So that is another reason to drive now you're making better money, but you're less likely, yes, it's racism, but you're less likely to encounter or be, go through these physical threats that, and violence that is associated with, with um, Jim Crow. So majority of the folks are coming out are, Missis are coming from Mississippi, Louisiana, and the Katy companies out of Louisiana. Um, and I believe mainly Eastern Texas, um, and in this case, this is really interesting. So Amos Marsh, which I came up and I didn't realize this, and this, is, this taught me something. Here is a very um, skilled lumberman who now comes out of the South. So of course he, first of all, ends and starts in, in McNary, but he actually moves on to other areas. And I think he's probably typical. We do know there was a seasonality to these workers. Those who came to um, the White Mountains, we all know there's snow in the White Mountains, which by the way, from someone from Louisiana had never dealt with snow, that was a huge adjustment. But when a lot of times these folks are going home to Louisiana during the, during the holiday seasons and coming back and working during the summer, of course, they're going home and telling their neighbors about these great jobs in Arizona and so on and so forth. And it, it helps to expand it. But in this case, Mr. Marsh, he actually comes out of, out of the South and heads to McNary and then moves on into, interestingly enough, which I didn't realize, California and Oregon seasonally. And um, just going to top a little bit real quickly in Maxville, Oregon, actually had a very much the Southern style lumbering uh, operation. Same with the segregation, but they too were hiring black lumber workers. Um, that, by the way, is a link to uh, a really great little PBS um, documentary about this, which I learned a lot out of it. Um, so yeah, they have 400 people there, 40, 60 of which were African-Americans. Again, we still see the segregation. And then also we will still see that same labor caste that you see in the Southern um, labor camps, uh, timber camps, but but you do see this mixing of, of this races. And I thought it was interesting, the Greek immigrants, that was interesting as, as we're building the railroad. And as all you know, railroads are a major part of the, the slumbering operations. So another, another part of that caste system, those who worked railroad versus those who worked in the, the actual on the ground. So, one of the unique aspects of the migration to Flagstaff, so once McNary is going and you've got this kid, the Katie, you also see that people start to branch out from the White Mountains into some of the other communities, Flagstaff being one of them. Also, Winslow, uh, Holbrook, Williams all start receiving these, these immigrants who are coming in. Williams had uh, the the Brown and Hatcher families who came into Williams in the 1950s, they actually started out, interestingly enough, in Peach Springs on the Havasu Pie Reservation, or Walla Pipe Reservation, and then moved to Williams following the opportunities. Um, Holbrook 
Winslow Winslow, I come to find out, actually has um, its own version of, uh, actually has a chapter of the NAACP. They meet once a year, I've been there, when, as well as Holbrook. Uh, Holbrook actually at one point had two black churches. So then there are still black communities, small black communities here. Flagstaff is one of the bigger ones. And this is unique because remember up until, up until coming to Arizona, they were in company towns. In this case, they're coming to the lumber industry, but it's not in a community that's being manufactured or managed by the company town, by the company. These are, they're coming into an established community of, of Flagstaff. So this is a, a difference in the change in terms of the, the way that, this, that these have been normally handled. And same with Williams. Williams, where I live, actually was, in fact, basically a company town. And it seeded once Saginaw Manistee left in 54, it continued. Um, but it was essentially a company town, whereas Flagstaff had already been established and, and had multiple mills here. So it wasn't just tied to one specific company. So just give, and this, this is some, from some oral histories that are at Klein Library that have been taken uh, from some of the workers. And this is the work that Jack did was pulling out some of this really critical information from these oral histories and talking about, you know, what, what, what they, you know, one of the perceptions as to why they actually were able to up, up in their entire lives and come here. One is the money was, was better. And that they have more opportunities because the southern system was was done. Um, but when they when they arrived here in Flagstaff, Flagstaff was in fact segregated. So that whole area south of the tracks, and you know that turned the one side of the tracks. Well, that was very true here in Flagstaff. So basically, that that cool hip area south of the tracks that everybody likes to go to because you got the cool hip restaurants there. That in fact was the black community of. Um, Flagstaff, and apparently those though that line called the railroad was very well in key, a very well a very hard line on the ground. So black people could not live north of the tracks. They women, I think women went and they were in service industries, hotels, restaurants, were cleaners, house housemaids, and that stuff in the homes of northern north of the tracks. But for the most part, the community was in fact south of the tracks. At one point, um, so in, in getting into this community and for all black people who are moving out of the South into in this, in the industry North or into the West, who you know is key. And community organizations are really important for helping people to figure out how to actually, you know, where to live, what are the social mores, especially when you're coming out of the South, it's very different. I mean, granted, it's segregation in the West. There's no question about it. But um, some of the social mores are very different. Um, people here, the, the down, the good side is we're talking about systemic racism and not Jim Crow. The downside is you're dealing with systemic racism. So, in other words, in Jim Crow, you know where you stand. Whereas where the systemic, it's not so certain. So it's it's a little different. So when you're coming out of the South, you have to learn to understand that difference as well. So, but those those social those social organizations are really important, and then and it is said a lot of these folks knew somebody already who was here. So then they are probably had family members or other people, and so it helps to have those connections, and it, and it means that you can navigate through through the system a little better. So again, the racial codes are a little different, the etiquette's a little different, and you can learn this through through the people who are here, but the threat of violence is less and you can actually vote. So, I mean, there's, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off. For the actual migration process, there was major barriers for people who chose to come and migrate. Um, being on the road, folks started, especially if they're in lumber towns, they started having things like disposable income and could do things like buy cars. And they could, uh, which created a lot of autonomy, and they could actually drive themselves or take the train uh, to Flagstaff. The downside is that um, there are a lot of businesses that would not serve Black people. And then you have this thing called sunset towns, where Black people could not be within the back town boundaries after sunset, basically. 
So understanding and navigating through, through those, those uh, barriers was in fact a difficult thing. That's why in the 30s, they developed something called the Green Book. And there was a famous uh, recent movie about this, but this is really critical for black people who were traveling the West at this point um, and uh, throughout the United States. And then later on, they actually started giving things up if, for those who wanted to travel in South America and Europe and other types of guidance. Um, so that it started out through the United States and, and um, Victor Green was a, he was a mailman in New York and the Green Book wasn't the only one, but he was the first. There were others, um, but this is probably the most famous. And as you can see, um, by the 1950s, they're listing Flagstaff. The El Rancho was actually on, um, it was on, on, well, basically where 89 and 64 come together. So right where Milton, it was basically on what is now Milton and it was torn down. And then I think the El Rancho, the, it was El Rancho and there's a couple other places that are still existent um, that would in fact allow black people to live there. What's also critical, and that's the reason I point out the, the Grand Canyon, Bright Angel, and of course it's misspelled El Toya, <laughs> El Tavar Hotel, these were being managed by the Fred Harvey Company. The Fred Harvey Company, which also managed all the concessions along the railroad, did not, did not um, discern who they served. They served everybody. So if you're a Black person coming uh, crossing the Mississippi into an area and you are, are either on the railroad or uh, driving, you actually could um, be served at a Fred Harvey house or a Fred Harvey restaurant. They actually employed a lot of people of color and even at the Grand Canyon. That was not true for all national parks, by the way. Um, but, um, but Fred Harvey had um, the concession for most of the West, Western national parks and black people were actually could be served at national parks. So just to give you an idea of what it was like to make that trip, um, you know, it, Using the green book, you could at least know where you could get gas. You could know where you could actually um, get food, um, any hotels. Although my grandmother who grew up in Arkansas moved to, Cal to California in the forties, when she went back to see family, she stocked up everything in her car and basically assumed that she'd be driving straight through because she didn't want to have to stop anywhere for fear of having these these issues and of course this we're talking we're talking the late 60s early 70s it became so ingrained in the way that black people travel so arriving at flagstaff there were plenty of mill jobs that that caste system that labor caste system continued to be enforced here in flagstaff although as as um Dr. Reed points out there was a little more upward mobility, I think, because people were staying longer, getting to know people. So they still, they still had, there, there were some opportunities. But Flagstaff had separate churches. Um, it had two black schools. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with the Murdoch Center, which is the one that's remaining. And in fact, with the black migrants coming into Flagstaff, that actually helped to um, it brought changes into Flagstaff as a community and helped to expand Flagstaff as, as a community. And there are, as, as many of you know, still a lot of people here or uh, who have been here since that time and still remain to be a major contributor to the Flagstaff community. So yeah, school segregation, um, just a point. Yeah, so there was two schools here in, in Flagstaff Williams didn't have a separate school for black students because there weren't that many black students. So they actually separate them. And then also Mexican students were actually separated out and taught separately. But there are families in, in uh, Mexican families in Williams who talk about this. Um, so the, there was a major, major impact on, on uh, Arizona. So workers throughout, this is here in Arizona. These are black workers who are out on the lumbering and they made up a good chunk of the, the, lumber, the labor population here in Arizona. Talking to a gentleman in Winslow, 
at the NAACP meeting. He mentioned he'd been here, I think his family immigrated here in the 40s and 50s, and he talked about the fact that in Winslow, there was a very large, fairly large black population there. And there are families who are still there, but as the logging industry waned here in Arizona, people left, they went to go find new opportunities. So you don't see the same level of population there or in, in here in, in Williams or, um, sorry, in Flagstaff or Williams for that matter, as there probably once was because many people moved on for other opportunities, but there are still families here and who are still part of this, um, this community who decided to stay and make this their home. So um, just an example, some of you probably all know um, Mayor Evans, uh, whose family, apparently her, I didn't realize this, but apparently her father was one of those folks who basically got on the bus that a company sent down to the South and looking for laborers. And that's how he arrived here. And, and um, Flagstaff, my understanding is she still lives in the home that her family had built. Um, but the Murdoch Center is still a major part of this community, having all sorts of community op um, opportunities. And this is cool. I didn't realize that they do this Murdoch. This is going on right now, first Saturday every month. Nice little commercial. Hang out, go spend money. They also do a very good Juneteenth event in celebration of emancipation. And there are um, black, there are churches, Baptist churches here that um, serve black communities and not only black communities, they're pretty much mixed race communities, but of these black churches, there's actually a church in Williams also, a Baptist church in Winslow, as well as I said to in the Holbrook. And these were started mainly for the black populations. So we are still seeing the influences of this migration of black people into the lumber industry here in Arizona. So I thought this is really good just to, what, how are we doing on time? Oops. Um, I think that this was really good as a final thought. And it was something that I learned and didn't as, as I did this research. And the bottom line is that the lumber industry is very transient. And it's really only in recent years that they begin to realize what the extent was of the lumber industry, not only in terms of the economics of the development of the South, but also here in the West. And, but because of its transient nature, as it says here, um, its transient nature, I think people have not really realized the, the, the larger impact or the larger um, role that the timber industry has made in. And, and the economy of the US. Um, and in some cases, in this case, as they point out, in the development of the major, you know, the industry as, an, as a nation. So you see the, so the way that the South developed its system that gets imported and, and overlaid as, this, as that industry dies and comes North and West, a lot of those, um, the technology, but also it's social mores, it's, it's class um, caste system, the labor caste system also comes out of the South and actually becomes part and part of the parcel of the lumber industry outside of the South. All right. I did better than I thought. So, um, questions? Yeah, yes. You have a slide about um, how black population growth across the white sites is under the rest of Yes. And that you had about 23,000 people by 1950. Can you tell us about your celebration and how much is that for growth? So the question is, I'm going to repeat your question. Um, the question was about the um, the census numbers, that table I put up to find out how how whether how much of that that movement into Arizona was due to just natural growth versus um, spurred on by this by the industry. Yeah, like migration versus like people. Uh, actually, I don't know. Um, this is all based on census. But I'd be willing to bet um, there's a couple of things about that. First of all, when we start enumerating people in Arizona, which is, by the way, about 19, 1860, which says that there are two people, two Black people in Arizona. So what they're really saying is there were two free Black people in Arizona. 
Um, there is actually a whole host of, of mixed uh, Black and African and Hispanic people who are here. Um, they're not enumerated at all and identified as being of African descent. So these numbers are actually not very good. So um, then, then being able to discern how much of that is just, you know, people already here and having babies versus immigrating in, I think that's really tough because remember the census, these are every 10 years and it's a, literally a snapshot in time. I would hazard a guess, guess though that the good chunk of that at that point by the 1940s and 50s, I think a good chunk of that is migration. Are there any questions in the chat? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, good. I hope some of the questions. Go ahead, Kat. I was wondering whether the main documentation was in this or whether it was exclusively men or very general. There, so you mean uh, women in terms of uh, working in the lumber industry? Were they employed? employed? I think that information can be get out. I think there were women, I think women were basically filling a lot of the administration roles is, is my guess. And I and that is something that probably needs to be looked at in terms of the women's roles in, in there. The nice thing about this, or at least the company towns is you have your whole family there. So there is a whole host of women who are in these communities. And they are probably the ones who are, who are holding or developing these social events and doing all and, and really in some ways are the backbone for maintaining a, a um, balance in these communities is be, would be my guess. But I think that's a study that needs to be still needs to be done. Yes. Thank you. Um, Thing that uh, that strikes me is the um, you know we see in this example in Arizona and in other places where there's lots of black people working in the forest, living in these areas, and then the uh, the change from that to where nowadays there's a perception in the way that black people tend to reside more in urban areas, mm -hmm. and as you know, um, as we see in the school of forestry. Sometimes don't choose these kinds of careers, don't choose to recreate these environments as much. And I just wonder if you have thoughts to share with us on ways that we could work to change it. And, and you're absolutely right. So those who didn't hear the question is, is we, you know, we saw that based on the history, we know that we had a lot of black people working in these in these areas, but you just don't see it today. And, and so you don't see black people choosing to get into this type of work and it's reflect here at the university. Am I correct? Did I paraphrase that well enough? And you're absolutely right. And I work for the forest service. <laughs> um, they're very there. And one of the, one of the things that we are discussing in the forest service is a lack of African-Americans within the agency. In fact, um, right now, I just, this, this year, it's come out, there's a lot of women who are leaving the workforce, so that's, that's nationwide. Um, and, they, and I just happen to have this number off the top of my head. In Forest Service, we've gone from African-American women, this is nationwide, we've gone from 1.4, make up 1.4 of the workforce to 1% of the workforce in the Forest Service alone. Um, so you're right, and you're right, and I think you you hit on it. You're seeing a lot of black people. Even I'd be willing to bet that those who were whose grandparents were working in the lumber industry here in Arizona, when this industry took an economic dive, they probably went to urban areas where they could find work. And that's probably my phone. My apologies. So. You know, you never get a call, and of course, you get a call <laughs> right in the middle of the one con top reason why you don't want one. All right, so bottom line is, is you're absolutely right, and that's not only black people. A lot of age, a lot of people of color, their families have gone and worked in in, in um, urban areas, and they've lost. You know, in some ways, they've lost that connection to the land. I, you know, I love Facebook, and one of the things I've been watching on Facebook is this this plethora of black people who are re rediscovering things like camping, rediscovering things like getting out and hiking 
there's a big black hiking group in, in um, Phoenix now, because a lot of the uh, black population of Phoenix are moving in. So you are seeing a movement of people of color. You've got Af Outdoor Afro, which is a support group for black people who are interested in getting outdoors. You've got um, um, Latino outdoors. Uh, you've got all this movement of these outdoor organizations. And this is to encourage people of color to start getting outdoors and reclaiming that landscape. I think part of it too, is that one, it's, it's a perception issue. So, you know, we left the farming. Why do we want to go back to farming? So there's a perception issue, but there is also an issue of they don't see themselves here. I'm showed, I showed up in the Forest Service uniform for a reason. There aren't a lot of black people who do this and, it, and representation and show up is really important. And if they're gonna see this as a, a career opportunity, they need to see themselves in this. That's why talks like this are important because I can guarantee you that there are a lot of black people who really don't know that, that the black history related to these timber industry. And they don't really know how, how pervasive or how important the black labor was to the national timber industry. So we need to tell this history. Any questions? Yeah. So you cited the, 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 the few papers that were like the journals in mm -hmm. the presentation. Do you have any other like books or resources you can suggest that we could like read the document or this history? Yes, um, I did. Uh, Dr. Reed's paper is important, um, and his and I loved the work he did. That was seminal for really to, bringing that out. I have, and through doing this work, came across a, a paper that was, in fact, they they cite Dr. Reed's work um, that was came out was it was a public Forest Service publication. Yeah, I'm Forest Service. You think I know this? No, I had to find it online. Uh, talking specifically called the sawmill towns and and I have it written down hold on um, let me if I can go back I actually did write down this um, so yeah Dr. Reed's um, work not only the paper we gave out but also he did a, a great article in the Journal of Arizona History um, in 2015 Southern Black Moot Southern Blacks moved to Flagstaff, 1940, 1960. I, that's absolutely critical. But the other one literally just came out and I did, let me um, find it. It is online. I found it uh, when I was Googling <laughs> and you can get, you can download a copy for free. Sawmill Towns, Work, Community, Life and, Indus and Industrial Development of the Piney Woods of Louisiana and the New South. This came out in 2020. I had not seen this until I did this work. Um, then they, there's a whole section in there that they talk about Arizona and the KD mine and they, they absolutely cite most of it coming out of Dr. Reed's work. So I think when, one of the things they point out in that is that this, is, this research that they've done is critical. This began for the very reason where I discussed people it's a transitory nature of the industry and people don't really necessarily understand its impact on the broader development yeah thank you for this i learned a lot um i was curious uh when when our industry dried up i guess that was the closure of the last mill in the 80s mm -hmm. were there particular places where um, African American among the workers went, or did they just kind of scatter everywhere? And that's a good question. So, uh, let me paraphrase with the dying of the industry here in Arizona in the 80s, where did people go to? Uh, and that's a good question. Uh, my guess is a lot of folks went down to Phoenix, Tucson, um, looking for opportunities going on, you know, in other places, Los Angeles. Um, so, as, as I, I'd be willing to bet a lot of folks went to cities. Um, in some cases, some people stay. So I know, for instance, in Williams, which is where I'm most familiar with, the Hatcher family, the, the two, two of the sons ended up in uh, the Forest Service. Edgar Brown from the Brown family actually went to work for the Forest Service also, and he retired Forest Service and became a, a bus driver for the school. He's still there. We wave at each other. 
Um, so some cases the family stayed and their children, for instance, one family in Winslow, um, their son is actually a fire management officer on the Coronado. Um, so some folks do go into urban areas, some folks stay and, and work in the area or, or you know, do what these folks did and got into agencies like the Forest Service. That's probably more the exception than the rule though. My guess is a lot of folks are going into urban areas. Okay, so it's time. So we'll conclude this presentation, but Margaret probably can stay a few more minutes. Absolutely. And answer more questions. And she also agreed to um, have this recording put on uh, NAS Call for its YouTube channel. So we'll put it on and please spread the word. And this is very important. And thank you so much. Oh, you're more than welcome. For coming. Ah, you're welcome. <laughs> should definitely pull up the chat because there's okay, lots of people ahead. saying good job and oh, good. that they really enjoyed it.